certificate of attorney and um, I do a lot of security work around the world. Um, my associate this morning is Matt Fiddler, who is a security consultant and uh, former military intelligence and does a lot of um, security work, uh, both hardware and software. Um, the impetus for this discussion this morning uh, grew out of last year, uh, the uh, conference in New York. I was part of a panel uh, involving uh, some vulnerability of locks issues, uh, which is what I mainly deal with. And as a result of that, there was a lot of controversy that was generated uh, in the locksmithing community and to the lesser extent the security community with regard to the ethics of disclosure of vulnerabilities of um, locking systems. And so we decided that we put together a, a presentation and really would like at the conclusion of our PowerPoint to solicit uh, from you folks as to what your thoughts are so these can be taken back to the um, hardware security community. Um, essentially, the locksmiths uh, and their organization have determined that there should not be any disclosure of defects or vulnerabilities other than the security professionals and uh, security management and other locksmiths. Um, I don't particularly subscribe to that theory, nor does Matt, and we want to go through why we do not. This obviously has been dealt with in the logical uh, security community a long time ago, but not really in the hardware community. And so we'll present a PowerPoint first. Uh, Matt will do that, and then uh, we want to solicit your comments uh, and input. Yeah. Great. Good morning, everybody. So as Mark said, we're going to run through this pretty quick, uh, and then we can hop down. we got some swag to throw out. Uh, and we really like the input uh, on questions which we're going to pose here in the presentation. So again, there are going to be a lot of questions. Uh, hold, your, hold your questions uh, in, until we reach the end. So this quote goes back over 150 years. Um, A.C. Hobbs uh, wrote this book, Locks and Safes. And um, you, you can read it, but it, it details that you know, the, the unscrupulous individuals already have this, this type of information. They already know about the defects. They're already exploiting them. Um, and it's better to provide this information to the public and make it available. Um, this was a Usenet post, June 2nd of this year, uh, from a locksmith. And, and again, you can read it, but basically, they're indicating that providing this type of information, I think this was in response to uh, Top Level Master Key or Eric Michaud's uh, multi-lock attack of late, and just indicating that, that this is all secret information that should not be published. So clearly there are no secrets. So we're going to talk about uh, the importance of, of full disclosure. We'll identify from a physical security perspective what, what defects are. Um, Mark will go into some of the legal issues of uh, full disclosure, statutory liability, um, ethics, and then we'll go into some case examples of the last year. So, again, locksmiths are, are the first line in, in most cases. They, they have publicly come out and said that questionable individuals um, like yourself... That would be all of you. ...should not have access to this information. Uh, so we clearly want your feedback on that. So defects, what are defects? They're simple bypasses, um, really simple tools. We're talking seconds uh, of bypass. Um, there's no physical dis destruction of the components. Um, and we believe that the lock manufacturers and experts should have foreseen these vulnerabilities. Um, again, a, sh a short time to, to exploit and, and bypass um, requires very little skill. Let me make a comment on that. Um, we're talking about the type of bypass that does not require sophisticated tools, expertise, and time, um, the type of tools that I routinely deal with, versus the ballpoint pen opening the tubular lock trick. Um, that's the type of bypass that we're really talking about. The, the simple, really, defects or problems that lead to the ability to circumvent a locking system. So I'm going to actually just put that to you on the... Uh, okay, well, the legal issues are real simple. The real question is, what does the end user have a right to know about the security products that they're buying and using 
and what's the liability for the locksmith or architect or hardware vendor if they don't tell you about a vulnerability and you put in that system and then you suffer a loss, somebody gets injured, somebody gets killed, there's a major theft, there's a compromise of information. Who's got the liability or is there any liability? And especially involving federal and state statutes regarding the disclosure and protection of medical information, financial information. These are serious legal issues. The locksmiths really haven't come to grips with them and frankly don't understand a lot of the problems that can face them. And as an end user security administrator or a person responsible for physical security, the real question is how much information do you have a right to know in order to make the security assessment? If you rely on a security consultant to make that assessment for you, that's fine. But if you're charged with the responsibility and fail to have all the needed information, then you really can't make that assessment and then who is liable? Those are really the critical issues. So as far as statutory liability, I'm sure most of you out there in the IT world are familiar with HIPAA, SOX, GLBA, all the regulatory compliance issues. HIPAA, over one quarter or almost one quarter of HIPAA statutes govern physical access control, access to facilities, file lockers, et cetera, containing protected health information. So clearly we're all in bed with these regulatory issues. SB 1386, the loss of information, information assets. It's incumbent on us to understand the physical hardware that protects these assets. So we'll get into the ethical debate. Again, the question we want to throw out there, we'd like to get your feedback. Come on up, ask questions. But again, if a manufacturer is notified, what should they do? Should they admit it? Should they be publicized? We'll talk about some case examples with Kryptonite, some other vendors, and how they handle the full disclosure. And ultimately, what is the vendor's level of negligence? And one other comment. If you find a security defect or a vulnerability that allows a lock or system to be bypassed, do you take it to the manufacturer without making it public, or do you make it public? And that's really an interesting question because if you take it to the manufacturer and they have a large embedded base of security products, do they make it public? The responsible manufacturers will. A lot of them will not. So where does that leave the end user? Okay, so a quick plug for security.org. And again, our view is except for national security issues, which clearly are uniquely limited to specific hardware. And a closed group. Full disclosure. Yeah. So the second point, the reality, if you disclose a defect but there isn't one really there, you know, what do you have? It's not a contribution. You know, someone else may or may not find it. So, again, we want to pose this question. We want to get your feedback. There's been a lot of public disclosures on physical vulnerabilities that haven't come to fruition. They were one-time bypasses that someone was able to do in a controlled environment, but they couldn't be rapidly duplicated. They weren't true defects. Well, the other issue is, and a lot of the locksmiths have propounded, okay, if there's a known vulnerability in a lock or a piece of hardware, okay, you can tell the public, yes, there's a vulnerability, but you can't tell them what it is. What does that do for you? In our view, nothing. Because the minute you disclose there's a hardware defect, somebody's going to find it. And if they find it, they're going to publish it. A lot of the locksmiths haven't heard of the Internet yet. And so they still believe that there are secrets out there, and as we keep trying to tell them, there are no secrets anymore. So some considerations for thought. Again, we don't want to question the public on the audience here. Need to know a full disclosure. The level of expertise that we spoke about, you know, some of the bypass techniques that we've disclosed and others have disclosed were compromised or applied by 10-year-old children in seconds with little or no training. You know, do we need to advise the manufacturer following the full disclosure procedures or just go out and do it and make this information public? Talk about system vulnerability versus component vulnerability. Defects are not component. Defects are 
and what's a security defect? Uh, a defect, a manufacturing defect versus a, a vulner, an exposed vulnerability, because there's a continuum of vulnerability versus a, a real significant design defect. And, and who should make these decisions? Uh, we, we had a disclosure last year, um, and the vendor, their, their engineers could not duplicate the exposure, yet I have my 10-year-old son doing it in, in a heartbeat. Uh, but their, their engineers weren't able, able to duplicate this vulnerability, so who, who should make that? Should it be the security experts, the vendors, their engineers? Well, let me even take it farther. Um, the real question is, who has the need to know? And, and let's talk about one of the security releases we did last year. Um, I found a vulnerability in gun lock, gun trigger locks. Really serious vulnerability to the point that literally I shot a video in Toronto with an 11-year-old kid removing three of the most popular gun locks off a rifle in seconds. Should that vulnerability be disclosed to the public or how should they be warned because at some point some kid's going to get hurt or killed by removing one of these gun locks that their parents mistakenly believe provide security on that weapon. It's a perfect example where there can be tragic results. Do you disclose it? Do you not disclose it? When I talked to one of the leading manufacturers in the industry who I did some work for a long time ago, they didn't want it disclosed. They didn't think it was a big problem and they weren't talking about it. And they haven't to this day and they continue to manufacture the locks. And, and these are major manufacturers that are putting this material out there. Every hardware car store and sporting goods store in the country sells them. Should they, should that be exposed in the national media? Okay, okay, and we'll talk about that in a minute because, well, you say yes until you're the parent of a kid that reads a report on the internet and then goes and pulls a gun lock off a weapon and shoots one of his classmates, and then you're going to be coming to me saying, what the hell did you publish it for? Because my kid wouldn't have known about it if you didn't publish it. That's the problem. I, I agree. We'll talk about it in just a minute. Right. Well, that's the attitude. We Actually, we took the attitude that we didn't publish it directly we, we charged a $3 fee for the report so that you'd have to have a credit card to buy it, which would eliminate virtually every kid from buying the report. And that's how we control distribution. All right. We're going to get some, some swag out. Let's, oh, yeah. That's important. Let's, uh, and, and RC and uh, Fast Bob and some of you guys can answer. Uh, what's that TMK? Oh. Yeah, that's it. In, in the in the in the hardware locks and hardware environment. Okay, here's, there you go. Here's a copy of Make magazine for you. We told you yeah. So you're all familiar with the, the controversy when we were in the New York Times two years ago on top level master key, um, as I've referred to it in my disc set and my book, extrapolation of the top level master key. Very very serious security vulnerability. Uh, basically, anybody in an organization that has access to one key to one door that's, that is on the top level master key system can compromise that system unless they have the proper locks installed, they've been coded properly, and they have the proper restricted type of blank with, with sidebar coding. It's a serious, serious problem. Yeah, so the, um, the, the second quote I have from uh, all that locksmithing in the beginning, uh, there was just this huge spread of uh, immediate backlash and locks fit huge up in arms. Um, you know, just literally attacking uh, that place and the uh, and, and that we compromise national security. Now, then of course they turned around and said, yes, but every locksmith has known about this for 50 years, so it's no secret. So, of course, there would be a slight inconsistency in that position, but it shouldn't have been disclosed, notwithstanding everybody knew about it. Everybody except the consumer. So the, the tubular lock bypass, uh, we, we, we first published this, um, first notified vendors in April of 04, um, and then shortly after Hope published uh, information on a wide variety of uh, computer peripherals from a wide variety of vendors. Um, it, it got some slash dot news, got some, a little bit of, um, you know, 
connection, uh, but it wasn't until an individual took that bypass technique and, and applied it to a kryptonite lock um, that it really hit the media. And, uh, and I guess bike users are uh, a little bit more crazy than uh, computer yeah, users. Right. Well, well, I can tell you the first two days that we posted that on our website, we had 100,000 hits. And I had thousands of emails from security administrators, from colleges, governments, hospitals, schools, wanting to know what to do about their laptop locks, which escalated into the bike lock issue and into gun locks that use tubular locks. The problem isn't with the tubular lock. The problem is with inexpensive tubular locks that aren't designed properly. Now, as a result of that, and I can talk about uh, Kryptonite, um, they really did the right thing. They um, they woke up one morning to all the, the flood of media, and it was sort of it was a it was a big surprise for them. And so they spent a couple of days looking at the issue, and then they finally made a corporate decision. They were going to replace every lock, which, which I believe was the very responsible thing to do. There, frankly, there wasn't anything else they could do. They, the management of Kryptonite, which is a sub company of Schlage Lock, um, they made the decision to bite the bullet. They admitted the problem, and they offered a free replacement no matter when you bought your lock. Um, they to date have replaced, my understanding, about 350,000 of them at a cost of about 10 million or more to Schlage. That is the responsible way to do it. And they've redesigned their lock, and so now it is a very secure piece of hardware. In fact, it has a security rating in Europe uh, from the rating agency. They're not going to be easily broken. Now, that's that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That, uh, we can't talk about that. Um, that that would never have occurred if actually we hadn't released our initial report and then uh, one of the bikers picked up on it and uh, described the vulnerability for kryptonite locks, where, which have been and are the leader worldwide in the industry. And so it's a prime example. You know, the bottom line is don't kill the messenger for the message. If you have a security defect or a vulnerability in your hardware, fix it or don't sell it. That's really the bottom line. Now, obviously, a lot of lock manufacturers don't subscribe to that theory, but they should, and the consumer really dictates that. Right. So, again, Kryptonite clearly did it right. Other vendors, and, and we're, we're not going to name names, but, again, their engineers could not duplicate. They couldn't take a big pen or a paper made flex grip ultra and bypass the lock. It's amazing. But I can also tell you that they are, because I'm in contact with a lot of them, they are implementing design changes to frustrate the problem. It's actually a very difficult problem to solve. It's not quite so easy as everybody thinks. But they, they all of the vendors that I'm dealing with, they are taking a responsible approach now, and they are solving the problem. Uh, okay, so bump keys or 999 keys, this is where a key is cut to its, um, its highest position on, on all the biddings. Um, to produce um, a uh, inertia effect against all the pins. The, uh, the key is inserted 90% um, of the way, and then it's bumped with, with a heavy instrument, causing all the pins to fly up, create a, um, a space with, at the shear line, and, and turn the key and open it. Yeah, actually, it's, it's Mr. Newton from England from exactly. 300 years ago that helped us out on that with his third law of motion. And he, every, he, he just didn't quite foresee it at that time, but that's exactly what it is. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And basically, when you wrap on the pins in a specific way, you create a, a few milliseconds of gap, and you can open the lock. I did some um, television interviews um, back at home demonstrating this because it is a very big security vulnerability. Barry Wells uh, has done a lot of work with it in Europe. And there's been a lot of publicity, not so much in America yet, but it is a problem for every standard conventional pin tumbler lock, not for the high most of the high security locks. But again, if the public doesn't know about it, then literally somebody can walk up to your your residence door, your business door, and in two seconds open it with no damage and no no real evidence of entry. Right, and, and I'm going to defer to Mark on the LSAT. Yeah.
Yeah, let me just address that for two minutes. About uh, seven, eight years ago, I got a phone call uh, from a locksmith in Hawaii, uh, L-Safe, which is the largest in-room safe manufacturer in the world. They're owned by the Asa Abloy Group. Um, has over a million safes in uh, luxury hotel rooms, and, and virtually all of them are insecure. Um, and they were at that time, although they rated them as a high security safe. We, I looked at it, documented the defect, and frankly had a 16-year-old kid that was working for me in the office for the summer open it with a uh, screwdriver and a paper clip in about uh, one minute. And this was brought to the attention of LSAFE. They really didn't fix it. They didn't acknowledge it. They didn't acknowledge that I even existed uh, because of the massive lawsuits that would have uh, flowed from it. This is a perfect example. Hotel guests have no clue. I've done a lot of work in the hotel liability area. A lot of hotel locks are not secure. They should not be relied on. And the hotels... They're concerned, but they're not concerned because they have statutory exemption from liability and they have insurance. And so it's a problem. And again, as a consumer, you ought to be aware of the problem. Uh, so again, the list, you know, Mark mentioned with particular locks uh, that extends across to a whole host of applications, uh, states, um, Harley Davidson, uh, disc brake locks, Jaguar keys are compromised with that. Um, it, it's huge. TSA luggage locks. Everybody's using them to lock their luggage when they fly. They're very insecure. Uh, we put out a security alert and demonstrated how you could take a piece of plastic from a credit card and open the most popular ones just by sticking the, a little piece of square plastic in the keyway. This is not security. And the real problem in that area is not theft from your luggage because it's easy to rip open luggage. The real issue in my view, and I did a, a magazine article over in Europe on it, is that contraband can be put into your luggage after you think it's locked, and if it's not caught in security, then it can be a real serious problem. Right, and, and again, Mark talked about the gun trigger locks. The multi-lock is an interesting one, and again, I'll, I'll let Mark talk about that, but Eric Michaud and Matt Blaze uh, recently published um, some bypasses against a multi-lock. It's a thin, thin um, type of uh, lock hardware. Um, they were able to, uh, supposedly able to, uh, compromise this. Well, multi-lock is a telescoping pin, high, very high security lock. They're made in Israel. I've been to their factory many times. Uh, they're also part of the Asa Abloy group out of Finland. Um, Eric Michaud actually thought he came up with a compromise. Um, when you are talking about bypass of locks, especially high security, one of the criteria is repeatability, and which I don't believe can be shown in this particular uh, bypass. Opening one lock doesn't mean anything. Opening all of them or 99% of them reliably within a time frame means a lot. That has not been demonstrated with multi-lock, and, and frankly, I don't think it will. I've done quite a bit of analysis on their locking system. It's a very secure device, but it was published. And the, uh, the flip side of this argument is, should it have been published until it was truly documented? Theoretical in the laboratory is one thing, but you don't cause a manufacturer problem or you don't cause the public a security concern unless you can document it. And so that really is the flip side of this argument. All right, so, you know, we're really looking to empower you with your, your experience, your vulnerability exposures, um, you know, to go out there, to, to look at hardware, to look at it under a different light. Again, we're going to have a question and answer session. I think we've got about 20 minutes. Um, but you have the knowledge, you have the curiosity, um, the tools and techniques. Um, there's a lot of information out there. Yeah, there's a lot of material on the net. There's some on our website that's publicly available. A lot of it's restricted, uh, but there's there's a lot of material out there. What you really have to understand these systems, and again, it all comes down to what is your need to know, which is where I think we ought to begin this discussion. What's your what is your need to know from manufacturers about vulnerabilities? So, if you want to come up, I'll, I'll bring a mic down. And and I think we ought to start off. What do you all think about the gun lock issue? And should it have been? Should we have disclosed it? That's almost unanimous. Anyone for a free copy of LSS Plus? Come on up. 
but ask a question. Actually, Matt, maybe they ought to come up afterwards because otherwise it's going to take time into the um, presentation. Maybe they ought to come up to get CDs afterwards. Right, yeah, we'll do CDs afterwards. Why don't we do this at 10 to 11 so that we don't take time into this? Can you comment on uh, electronic um, access control systems at all? Vulnerabilities? Can you comment on the vulnerabilities of electronic access control well, systems? Well, actually, I just did a, um, a survey study of, of all of the access control technologies for, the, for one of the government agencies. Um, some of them are secure. Some of them are marginally secure. There's been a lot in the media about how things can be compromised. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the real question is if there's a security vulnerability on on the electronic side, should it should it be published? What's your attitude? Okay, so should it be published? That's exactly correct. So, but the question is, should it be published? Yeah, use a, you need to use a microphone. I believe it should be, but manufacturers should be given some disclosure period so that they can react to it. And yeah, if I they're mean, going to, that is the responsible way to deal with it, unless national security is involved. Yeah, I mean, most manufacturers, us included, are working on you know preventing these right. things and coming out with new technologies and. And it would be unfair for it to be disclosed before we had a solution to no, the no, problem. No, no, I agree with that. Okay, next question. Hello. Um, my concern you have is to speak with up. my concern is with the HID card systems that I installed uh, just about every server room I had a chance to work in, and to date. I have not seen any uh, published reports, any vulnerabilities on the system. I, I'm sure they exist, but what I'm uh, basically concerned about is electronic systems. Well, obviously, the, and Matt, maybe you should address that, but the old systems obviously were compromised. The newer ones are a little bit more difficult. Right. Matt? So, so HID has um, their traditional uh, proximity-based um, cards have been compromised. There is public information out there to duplicate a card. Um, the new HID I-Class cards um, defeat that, um, that capability, but there is uh, publicly available information on, on the HID cards. Next. What, uh, what, do, what do you think about a peer review system like they do in scientific journals for law? Lock security. Say that again. So in scientific journals, the, what they do is they sort of publish them and then let everyone verify it before it's considered good. What if you, you think it might apply well to lock? Spinning? I think that happens on the internet about locks. It's just that it can really cause a manufacturer problem if you publish that there's a vulnerability. Well, I, I mean, do you think we could we could sort of engineer a place where you could publish a possible vulnerability and people wouldn't lose their head? I don't think. See, I, I think that'd be all right. So my, my theory and Matt's theory and all this is the more people that are looking at locks, the better, because all it can do is improve the end product. There's a lot of sports lock picking clubs in Europe. Um, I go to some of them and, and routinely visit with them, speak, and, and learn. They're just starting in America, and Matt can address that more, but I think it's a good thing because there are engineers, lawyers, doctors, teachers, kids, housewives. It's an, to pick a lock is an intellectual challenge. It's not just mechanical. It's, to me, it's much better than chess. I've been doing it since I was 15, and it's intriguing. In fact, I'm, I'm doing a new book on the subject. And it is really intriguing. And so the more people that are looking at locks and finding potential exploits, in my view, the better. And the responsible manufacturers will agree with me. They want the input because at the end of the day, they want to make the best locks possible. End of story. Next. Yeah, so um, r briefly, um, lockpicking101.com is the definitive source for, for information. Um, they, they've started um, some, some uh, lock sports organizations. Um, there's one in Europe that Barry Wells runs its tool, um, tool.nl. I think the URL was, was in the presentation. Um, but so lock sports uh, are picking up. Clearly, we have the lock picking competition here. Um, it's, it's a blast. It's a lot of fun. So I'm curious to get the thoughts on, and going back to the tubular gun lock issue, um, if you remove as far layers as you want to go, that also includes safes, um, store locks, 
to the gun stores. Um, given the number of lawsuits that have come against gun manufacturers for what have happened, do you believe there will be a change before there's a lot of lawsuits against gun lock manufacturers for the same thing? No. Uh, you know, it depends. If they're negligent, if it was purely a negligent design, yes. The, the real problem in lock picking and decoding and impressioning is one of expertise and, and skill level and time and tools required. If, if a 10-year-old kid can open a gun lock by wrapping it on the floor or sticking an ice pick into it, which is what I demonstrated, and pop it off the weapon in two seconds, I think they're going to get sued if, if somebody gets hurt or killed. That's a de it's a defective manufacturer and they all copied each other's defects. If it's more, if it's more esoteric than that, no. Well, the, the reason why I mention that is uh, a lot of the lawsuits that have been against the manufacturers of guns have just been because they're guns. Yeah, that's um, right. And so going along those lines, if we do end up with something like a mandatory gun lock law, which could happen, um, given the fact that the locks actually work and you're still able to use a weapon, do you see that going down the bad path? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if the gun locks work, and, and I'm dealing with some manufacturers in Europe on this issue, if they work and then there's a defect and you're able to file the, fire the weapon, it puts them a lot closer to liability. I, I'm not sure. I, gun locks are a really complicated problem. Next. In the American patent system, um, you know, we're, we're dealing with software now, and it's stifling innovation left and right. I was wondering if you think that it, I was wondering about your opinion on whether or not the American patent system is stifling or helping innovation in the creation of locks you mean the patent and better system? locks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's helping. I mean, look, if you're inventive and create something that is unique and provides security, some of them do, some of them don't. The patent doesn't guarantee security. I think uh, you know our system rewards you for that, that gives you a monopoly on that product for 20 years. Um, every major design defect in locks is described in patents and proven. And so I, I've done a lot of research in the U.S. and English patent offices to find out vulnerabilities from, from when I write books. And so, you know, it, it, it's a positive thing. So harder designs actually do make it into multiple vendors of locks. Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, sure. Yeah, look, there's nothing new in locks. Everybody copies and, and everything and modifies it for patents. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, but, but you mentioned the uh, full disclosure, except in cases of uh, uh, national you know, uh, security. If but you found out, like, some government uh, organization was using a, a certain brand of lock, and you know that uh, using was... Using what? This audio system is not really good. If but you found out that some government uh, organization, you know, or like some base, was using a certain brand of lock, and uh, you knew there was a screaming vulnerability, and you brought it to, you know, either the attention of security forces or, or someone in charge of security on the base or or uh, organization, and uh, well, they didn't do anything about it. I think. I mean, how do you normally handle that? I mean, what do you just? Well, like you bring it to their attention. That's a real judgment call. I've I've brought vulnerabilities to GSA's attention and did not publish them upon their request. Even though their first comment was, if it's not covert, we don't care. If you have to drill a hole in the lock, we don't care. I said, okay, we're going to publish it. No, you're not. Why not? Well, because it's a security problem. Well, but it's these locks are used in the banking industry, and everybody ought to know about it. No, they really shouldn't know about it. And if you publish it, we'll classify it. Now, that was the government's response. I wasn't afraid of their response because I don't think they could sustain that, but I didn't publish it because it was a responsible thing to do. Mm, about five years ago. Regarding the situation where you disclosed to the manufacturer first um, before the public giving them a chance to do like what Kryptonite did, right? Um, what kind of turnaround time is reasonable for a manufacturer to be able to reach Oh, I think Kryptonite was pretty reasonable. They did it in like two months. Really? Yeah. They, they had a huge problem, and they acknowledged it, and they fixed it. 
I mean, they did what they were supposed to do, and it cost them ten million bucks to do it, and with no questions asked. You know, they didn't depreciate the. If you had had that lot for ten years, they still gave you a new one. They didn't depreciate the value like your insurance company would do on your homeowners and say, well, that lot's only. You know, you paid a hundred for it, but it's only worth twenty five. So now we're going to give you a coupon for twenty five to go buy a new one, which would have been a marketing bonanza for them. They didn't do that. They just replaced it. They said, hey, you know, send us your lock or send us proof. We'll send you a new one. I don't. I don't know if they. I don't know if they. Probably not. I don't know. But they do have a better lock now. It's a tough lock. I understand your argument about defective. You know, being something that maybe a ten year old could could open versus a skilled person. But you know, I don't have any ten year olds running around my corporation. And if I go to buy a lock to lock the data center door, you know, I want to be. I think as a consumer, I'm surprised that the Consumer Product Safety Commission or somebody else wouldn't go after manufacturers because you know we've had Firestone for the for the Ford tires on the SUVs. For the pharmaceutical company, people got killed. People got killed. But you know, I mean, if I if I lock my house and and a skilled burglar comes in and murders me, I you know I'm I'm killed. Vioxx, the anti arthritis drug, it was you know clearly uncovered that they knew there was a problem and and swept it under the rug and they're being punished for that fact. Will this happen in the lock industry or? I don't think so. It's a different set of problems and frankly, the problem is in all those cases you've named, you're not dealing with criminal actions. Here you're dealing with somebody that's violating the law, and you really can't control that other than criminal statutes. That's the sanction. And so the real question again that nobody's really addressed yet is what's your, how much information do you think you ought to be entitled to from the lock manufacturer and who ought to be entitled to it? But isn't the lock's sole purpose to prevent criminal action in some ways? I mean, that's why I'm buying them. Yeah, that's true. Is it a criminal party? Yeah, I agree. But it's a little more complicated. That's right. Now, they're trying to sue the gun manufacturer. Right. Well, yeah, okay, but that's not going to go anywhere. Next question, because we're running out of time. Instead of waiting for a lock manufacturer to invest marketing dollars and then pissing them off by releasing a security breach in their lock, do you think the manufacturers would consider almost like a hardware open source review of their design before going to market so that they could avoid this problem? No. Why not? No. But isn't it better than waiting? Well, first of all, until they receive a patent, they're not going to publish anything. That's the way things work. And, I mean, part of the security of locks is you not knowing how they work. But didn't you just prove security by obscurity doesn't work? Yeah, well, actually, I'd prefer to call it security by ignorance. And that's really what it is because, look, if you're a security manager, IT professional, you're charged with a physical security responsibility as well as logical security. You can't make the risk assessment in your organization unless you know what the bypass techniques are and are shown what those are. If they'll tell you that, I don't have a problem with their policy. I don't think we ought to be telling criminals how to bypass locks. If you have a need to know because you have a protection responsibility, I think you have a right to know everything about that lock. Now, unlike software and Bill Gates and everybody who doesn't tell you, doesn't give you the code, if you're smart, you can take a lock and it will tell you everything about itself. So if you're smart enough to figure it out, the information is there anyway. But I think you have a right to know that information. How can you differentiate between a consumer and a possible criminal? Well, that's a real good question because if the consumer relies on his locksmith or their locksmith as their security professional, then no problem. Let the security professional say, look, yeah, there's a vulnerability. You don't need to know what it is. I mean, my mother, she puts new locks on their house. She doesn't need to know how to pick them or open them. She just needs to know, is it secure and how long would it take a competent burglar to open it? Well, first of all, burglars don't open locks by picking them. They use a crowbar or a brick. Ninety-nine percent of the burglaries are done that way. We're talking about more sophisticated burglaries and information theft and compromise of data and that type of thing. So next question. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Just a quick question about it. Um, you were saying that 50 years they, they knew how to circumvent the tumbler lock. And I'm wondering if the information space in lock picking is a lot tighter than information security because 50 years the public hasn't heard about this. Honestly, they really haven't. It's really quite amazing. This has been around for a long, long time, especially on the bump key right. and on master keying. A lot of folks know about it. The, the locksmithing community was aware of it. The problem was they weren't telling their end user customers. Right. A lot of them didn't understand it. So the end user customer had no way to assess their risk. So the second part of the question I had is, you know, for the kryptonite locks, I don't know a lot, a lot about locks, but I know about bikes. And I haven't seen before this vulnerability was published anyone who whose kryptonite lock ever was really knocked open. Yeah, using well, you wouldn't. I'm, I'm sure there are, but I was wondering if you had any statistics. This, that actually, what we published, a vari variance of that was published about 10 years before in the UK. Nobody paid any attention to it. You know, it's just if you understand lock picking theory and impressioning theory, then it's a real simple deal. Thank you. Next. Yeah. Um, going to travel locks for a second. About 10 years ago, actually maybe 12 or 13, we had uh, something, uh, an attempt by the government to put something into place called key escrow right. in cryptography. Um, would you consider the, the quote unquote TSA safe locks to be a form of physical key escrow? No, they're, first of all, they're ten dollar cheap locks, and the problem is the public doesn't understand that. They think they're buying security, and it's a matter of convenience. Look, you have two choices. You, if you want to lock your luggage to prevent pilfering, allegedly, then you put a lock that TSA can get into because otherwise they're going to cut the lock because they have a legitimate interest in seeing what's in your luggage. End of story. I mean, that's why TSA locks were developed. The, the, a, a trade organization got all the lock manufacturers together, established criteria for five different kinds of locks that all have master keys or a, a, a bypass key that TSA can get into. That's their sole purpose. But 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 isn't isn't that a f that's uh, that's not a form of key escrow? It's yeah. not a form of giving them here's the pattern for the key to well, get yeah, into the okay. lock. In, in that regard, yeah. But I don't think anybody's going to disagree that TSA doesn't have the right to check your. No, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying yeah. that this is this yeah. is maybe. I yeah. mean, it's a okay. it's a loose parallel. I don't, I don't think it's exact. But okay. Yeah. All Next. right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I would just, I would recommend, I travel a lot, and I would recommend instead of using a lock, use a, a penetration tag. Use, like, the little wire tags or something like that. Because at least that way you know if somebody broke into the back. You you, you tagged it, you know if, right. you know, when you pull it. Yeah, let's see, if you're not going to be able to lock, he said, you can, you can lock it back up, and they can stick something in there, lock it back up, you won't know. Well, it's not TSA that I'm worried about sticking something back in there. They'll steal it, they won't put it back in. <laughs> No, well, right, that's, we, been, we, that's been documented. There's been lots of arrests. The problem is your hotel porter in London putting something into your locked luggage that you don't know is there, either narcotics or explosives or whatever, and you think you're okay because it was locked. That's where I think the problem is. we yeah. we got time for one more quick question. Yeah. Hey, Mark, a year ago at Hope, you talked about the idea of a national security college. Did anything ever come to that, that idea? And is that you still looking into doing something with that? I'd love to do something with it. I had some media interest, but nobody, it's America, nobody does anything. I think it's a great idea, though. I, are we out of time, Matt? Yeah, we're out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pleasure.